in this very beautiful, pristine area surrounded with these mountains. And so as a potter, you know, you or ceramic artist working in this environment, you're sort of fed by quietness and beauty. You know, Montana is a huge state, but it's still small because there aren't many people who live here. And so we have to be connected. Nature and wilderness in contrast to like when I look right across outside of my window here, I see oil refineries. How is that imagery narrative going to play into my work? Because there is this very strong juxtaposition and contrast between nature versus culture and what do we need to survive and yet the pristine, amazing beauty that's present in Montana. And that's what I want to bring more into my work. Drawing into the clay, almost like I'm recording stories into a tablet, thinking of ancient Sumerian tablets in this way of communication and recording stories around me. Recording stories around me. Some of the birds that I've been drawing are endangered, so I'm kind of re recording these animals or creatures and thinking that maybe in the future they won't be around anymore. And these pieces are recording their presence. I enjoy the physicality of it, and so I like there to be a looseness and visceral directness or freshness with it where I'm not overworking it too much. I have a press mold and I'm pushing clay into it without, without too much of a plan. And I especially like when there are these cracks and fissures that oh, happen. Oh, so okay. they look like they're weathered, they look okay. like they're pieces of antiquity or artifacts, artifacts. I never felt like I had a relationship with land before until I moved to Montana. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like the Bitterroot is my home mm -hmm. and the, the familiar canyons and the, the water and the rocks mm -hmm. and all the beauty that's out there and the solitude that you can find with the land. I just think that's incredibly important for any person's sanity, but especially helpful for creative people. Even uh, when I was going to school, when there was a lot of uh, abstract expressionism and there was uh, certain kinds of styles going on in New York um, that you were supposed to be following, I think I still got the sense that I, I could try something different. And, and I think that, that that's probably what happened for me. And, and then, you know, just the kinds of inspiration of the people that I've met here. I have been working with images of children for a long time, and uh, pretty much since my own child was born in, in the late mm -hmm. 80s. And uh, the idea of how, what it's like to be a parent and what it's like to watch a child grow and then also memories of my own childhood and reliving my own childhood. And I would say most of my work is somewhat introspective. So to a certain extent, this is a really emotional piece. I feel like um, the word flood conjures up flood of emotions, but it also conjures up the, the, the natural disasters of floods. I originally came to Montana to be a resident at the Archie Bray Foundation. And I had never been to Montana before. I mean, I, and I thought I would be here for a year. And that was September of 1985, so 25 years later, here I am. <laughs> for me, it has been a kind of incremental process of putting down roots and the, sort of my, the growth of my attachment to this place and also to realizing that I couldn't have made a better choice. We're so lucky because there's this world famous ceramic art center in this small Rocky Mountain town. At least 20 different artists come through the Bray every year. I mean, just as residents. The world network comes here to this small town, you know, and I have just that access to that energy and that information and those people. For me to do my work, living in a small town is a good thing where it's pretty quiet, where the daily hassle factor is pretty low. For me, the thing that is has been special and really a benefit about being in Montana is that, is that sense of space, which is physical for sure, but also because this is kind of a young culture because it's a place that people have come to to 
do their own thing, it, it leaves you a sense of, uh, that sense of openness and possibility. And maybe I say that as someone who grew up on the East Coast and went to college in Boston, and you sort of feel like, oh, it's all been done there, and it's all been done so well that there isn't that room for you to do your own exploration. Do your own exploration. Riding my bike around Missoula and seeing the ridgelines and the way the sky hits the ridgeline is the most magical thing in the world. I did a residency at the Clay Studio of Missoula and that's what brought me here. And I think that Montana is a magnet for clay artists and I think a lot of it has to do with wood firing and having this fuel around us. And I think that it has a lot to do with the Archie Bray and the foundation they built for clay artists. Those ridge lines are just magical to me and where the sky hits it. to explore and so much to continually explore and ceramic artists in general are really open to sharing those and and building that community and I think that's why clay community in Montana is really strong. to Montana, we started looking for a place to live in Montana because of the Ochi Bray Foundation. And so that was a big draw. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people are attracted to the region, the area, because of the foundation, Ochi mm -hmm. Bray. The university here, you know, has a great program and people come and then they don't want to leave. The natural environment has played a huge role in my work. I think if I had lived in a more urban environment, it wouldn't be quite the same. It's created my vocabulary. It just feels like an endless resource for me, visually and kind of metaphorically. Latticey work is open so that you can see into the interior mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the figure, the animal, and the lion in this case. It has a little suspended human figure inside. So there's this sort of mysterious yeah. other in there that you're not aware of initially. And people present themselves in ways where you may make an assumption of what they're like, but their internal experience mm -hmm. may be very mm -hmm. different. Kind of rude experience mm -hmm. of being a woman and a mother and sure. raising children, the whole experience mm -hmm. of just being kind of mm -hmm. a part of the whole natural process. Right. Of, raising and nurturing and um, life cycles and sure. all that is a huge, mm -hmm. huge part of my life that I feel, you know, it's very personally enriching mm -hmm. and important. Mm -hmm. so. So if I do a single figure, human figure, usually it's a woman just coming from my own experience. So. There was a time when I was an undergraduate in graduate school that I veered off into funk for a while and everything was just kind of a joke, a one-liner. I always came back to some kind of political message. There were a lot of Vietnam pieces, there were a lot of uh, Richard Nixon pieces, not, not for the guy. You know, after those things were over, once Nixon was gone, once the Vietnam War ended, it almost seemed like those pieces were dated. And some of the more successful ones still have the, the, the potent message. But I thought, well, you know, the, the Nixon pieces became kind of like these curios, you know, little political buttons and stuff. And I started to think more of trying to make the message more universal. I like to think of it in, in uh, the context of something like Guernica specific incident in 1937 in Spain that we probably wouldn't even be aware of, was it not for the painting? You know, and that painting has such potency that it could be anywhere. I don't 
don't really know how much effect this work has on the way things are. I mean, I'm certainly not going to make the teapot that saves the world, but there have always been artists who uh, tie their work to things they see around them and their concerns. And, I, you know, I, I, I've been one of those artists and I'll, I'll be one of those artists. Mm -hmm. If I live long enough to see, uh, you know, the last nuclear weapon on Earth dismantled and, uh, you know, true universal peace, I'll be glad to stop the social commentary stuff and spend the rest of my life, you know, just doing nudes. That's, uh, you know, I gladly trade. All this work is evolved from from my daughter's little, uh, uh, she was six years old. And, you know, she, as most kids that work with artists, they're in the studio periodically when they're growing up and you encourage that. But uh, she's always making something and I, I she glazed this one up, we put it in the kiln, I really didn't pay much attention, but when it came out, it just had this, I don't know, this, this sort of naive quality to it, but yet a real life uh, to it. And I th said, what, you know, what is it? I, I couldn't quite make it out. She said, Dad, don't you know it's a window? It's, it's a window. And I went, duh, you're right, it's a window. Huh? You know what this did? It brought me back after 25 years to why I think I got into ceramics to begin with. And that's the, the squishy, the feely, touchy, tactile yeah. uh, thing, the instinctual tactile thing. So all these things, even though they're, they look looser than they actually were to make, they're a little tougher than that to make. But, uh, you know, it really brought me back to that, both in terms of the tactile quality and also the firings. They were all atmospheric firings, which potters, love they love the I was trained as a potter and potters love that you know fire and smoke and all that stuff going on Clay is a material that really I could engage my thoughts, my ideas. I was able to really work with it. A lot of artists, I think, need, especially sculptors, they need a little bit of resistance with material. But for me, I seem to work better with soft materials. I can go back into it. I can completely stop, completely stop halfway through a piece. I can come back later. It's, very, it's, it's a very finicky material, but it's also a really forgiving material. I have a studio at my house. I work there quite a bit and I spend, I kind of split my time. I split my time between my students at school and my studio at home. One thing feeds off the other and I really enjoy teaching and I enjoy working with the students. 
there's a freshness to what they do. There's an uncertainty to what they do that I feel like a lot of times in your own studio, you can kind of, you hone in on something and it becomes your work and you research it more and more and you can really push it around. And the students are just, they're really free. They're just wild with their work in a way that's, it's very refreshing. There's something about objects and building and communicating poetry of my sculpture and how I hope it conveys ideas and meanings. And for me, there's a, there's a beauty to the, a little bit of the unknown and not quite getting everything when you look at art. And it, I feel like it, it holds you and it, it, it draws you in a little bit deeper. People often ask me, how come I make work or how come I make art? And that's a harder, should be an easy question, but it never seems that easy. My whole life, I've made things. When I was a kid, I used to go down in the woods and, you know, everybody has these stories, but I'd go down in the woods and I'd dig the clay out of the cliff sides and make little objects and come back and I'd fire them in my mom's oven to 400 degrees and just, which I guess all I really did was just really dry them out. Think about why do why do I make art, and then I think you know why do we why do we need art, and what does it do? It 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 fills it fills something that without artwork is empty, and I think that's a personal thing. It fills something within myself, but it also it fills something within a space. It there's an interaction there. There's a there's a physical interaction with the work, and there's an interaction between the work and a space. If you walk into somewhere and it has no artwork, it really feels like I think to most people feels like it's missing something, and there's this exchange that happens between ourselves and those objects or those paintings that I really feel creates a rich environment. That's the kind of environment that's important to me. And I feel like it's important to a lot of people. Clay can capture things that other materials can't. And what I mean by that is it, it has a memory and it, it remembers your fingers on it. It remembers your fingerprints on it. You can come back in and clean that up. You can leave them there. One thing that I try and work on with my work is being sensitive to that and being aware of the marks I'm making or the marks I'm erasing. It has a memory 